Welcome back. Uh, my name is Richie Mehta. I am here this <coughs> afternoon with what I can only say is an esteemed um, number of individuals um, here to talk about what I think um, as, a, as a topic we're all pretty familiar with because it was actually named a number of times in the opening sessions um, this morning. Um, so let me just quickly introduce um, the panelists. Um, we've got uh, at, at the far side uh, Dr. David Landsman from Tata Europe. Um, we've got Suhail uh, Sait, um, who's an esteemed author. And we've got Steve uh, Kilvington from BAE Systems. Um, before I hand over to the panelists for opening remarks, for the uninitiated on, in the Make in India movement, I just felt I would give you guys a little bit of an overview and some of the key headlines and statistics that are, that are going around uh, today. So um, this was uh, Narendra Modi's brainchild that actually was initiated in September 2014. And actually, it was part of a um, part of his strategy to actually turn India into one of the manufacturing hubs of the world, very much try to mirror and outbeat the, the Chinese equivalent. And in fact, the ambition so large that actually they wanted to create, or the ambition was to actually have manufacturing about to, to, to accumulate about 25% um, of GDP by 2020. Um, so in actual fact, this actually um, you know, was one of the, the, the key sort of strategies for, for the government. Also, when, you, when we think about it um, on a broader scale, I actually think it was to try and leverage and create and make India one of these global leading manufacturing hubs for both domestic and foreign companies. So to that end, one has got to wonder how effective and actually whether the strategy is working today. And on the surface, the key headline statistics is that it's actually doing pretty well. So for example, in the ease of doing business report, one of the key metrics that India is currently using, India has actually moved up 12 places to 130 out of 189 countries in doing business. Since launch, the Make of India movement um, in September 2014, there's been cumulative FDI inflows of 79 billion. And that's actually been a 45% increase um, you know, across the same corresponding period. And in fact, if you look in the Make in India website, which I have to say is really quite jazzy, going back to some of the digital transformation that we talked about, fully mobile responsive, interestingly enough, as well. <laughs> it, in, indeed. It actually suggests now that um, India is the most open economy in the world for FDI investment. Now, I think that's great rhetoric, and we talked a lot about slogans and sloganization, and I think the Make in India movement is probably one of the largest or, or best examples of that. But what I'd like to do here today, um, over the time we have remaining, is to actually ask the panelists to dig below the surface a little bit to truly understand some of the <coughs> dynamics that are taking place within the Make in India movement. So with that, um, with that in mind, I'd like to, to move on to the panelists for some opening remarks. Um, I'd like to first turn to Steve um, to talk about some of BAE's experiences um, in India ma in manufacturing and particularly pertaining to, to Make in India and how that's Absolutely. impacting you. Thank you. Um, I think Make in India is, is a very important initiative um, and certainly one that we're very uh, cognizant of supporting. But actually for, for my company, BA Systems, it's actually not a new concept. Uh, we've had a presence in India now for something like 60, 70 years, I think, as part of our heritage companies. You know, Tiger Moths were being used to train Indian Air Force pilots in the Second World War. Um, we've had a number of products there, and then in the 60s, um, developing our relationship with, with HAL down in Bangalore, the Hindustan Aeronautics uh, Limited, where in the 1960s they um, started to build our Avro 146 aircraft. Um, that then quickly went on to them producing the Jaguar uh, fast attack aircraft, and more recently the, the Hawk advanced jet trainer. Um, the original, original contract was in 2004. I think for 66 aircraft, of which 24 were built in the UK and the remaining 44 were built in India. We had to ship something like, I think it was 26 million parts to actually do that, quite a logistical challenge. Um, there was a second contract then in, in 2010, I think for an additional 57 aircraft. Uh, we then had to only ship 20 million components. Um, not much you may think, but when you consider the challenge of working with the, the Indian supply sector and the, um, the quality of the product and the pieces that need to do it, I think is, is significant. Um, 
and actually, just to say now that, that um, within these walls, how can produce a, a Hawk aircraft quicker in India than we can in the UK? So, you know, clearly, I think we've gone a long way to doing that. So, you know, for us, Make in India is, is, is a clearly a, a, a slogan and a, and a mantra that we follow. Uh, we're doing that now in terms of a lot of the other programs that we're looking at. I mean, our strategy is clearly to work with uh, local industry um, to help them to deliver technology transfer to them, to help them to indigenize uh, capability and to indigenize product. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we are fully supportive. Um, I must be clear, though, that it will not come without issues, as we've, we've heard so far today. Uh, Make in India can only exist as part of a wider regulatory um, set of reforms. Um, but, um, yeah, no, one that we, we fully support. Thank you, Steve. So here, over to you. I don't have a television commercial for BA systems like Steve has to tell you about all the things that are happening, but I'll just give you a few headlines. Number one, there is no option but to have Make in India. Uh, if you look at our GDP construct, we were woefully declining in the area of manufacturing. You can't feed a population <clears throat> which is demographically attractive without employment. Uh, so Make in India was important and continues to be important. Number two, if you look at the sectors that have opened out as recently as last week, including the aviation sector, more in the defense sector, I think we've got to understand where India is today. Thankfully, we don't have uh, Boris Johnson as one of our team members, so there's no hesitation that we are on the planet and not, are not leaving anywhere soon. I think we've attracted more FDI in the last two years than we've attracted in the last seven years before the two years. So where does this leave India? I think at four strategic advantages. Number one, a great skills force, because parallelly there's a skills mission that's also running, 200 million by 2020. Whether we achieve that figure or not is, is debatable. Even if we achieve half that figure, it's a job well done. Number two, it was important for the government, and Steve alluded to that, important for the government to tell people that India is ready for business in a transparent, effective, and quick manner. Otherwise, it was a minefield to navigate, and that's because of various historical issues. Number three, there is greater, and I can say this with all confidence, and I've abused every government in power, <clears throat> this is the first time that the union cabinet in any Indian government is corruption-free. There is zero corruption. I mean, they don't even take bottles of whiskey, I think. So, you know, you're headed towards a more robust, transparent uh, a place to do business in. But what is very critical is that we shouldn't move our eyes from the historical benefits of manufacturing that India has seen. David sitting here, the house of Tata, Reliance, Mahindra and Mahindra. Look at the Detroit that we've created in Madras uh, and the hubs that we've created around Delhi in Gurgaon. So we are already feeding a large part of the world's auto ancillary requirement. More and more manufacturing is happening out of India. Precision manufacturing is what we need. You know, he talked about aircraft. My other concern is that we need more investment in infrastructure, which the government is now open to, to getting. Earlier, we had all these, you know, taboos. Oh, my God, if we have people in the security areas, in defense and all, will India's security be threatened? No. So people have realized that in order to give Philip to manufacturing, it is very important for two things to happen. Number one, labor reforms. Number two, business and ease of business reforms. Both have been started in good measure. I believe that India today has, using Make in India, you might call it a slogan, often people only remember headlines. When was the last time you remembered the body copy of an advertisement? So I think it's important for that slogan to reverberate, to tell people across the world that we don't only want to be seen as a back office, we want to be seen as the front office of the world ready to manufacture in India. Because the one problem, and some of the speakers referred to that in the earlier session, we had this crazy word called jagar, which means the Indian style of a shortcut, suggesting that we are innovative. I think we've got to stop jagar, and we've actually got to get down to doing manufacturing in the way it should be done. We're ready. I think Modi's done a fabulous job by actually igniting 
this, this flame of reason and rationality in the Indian population and across the world. He's actually marketing this. The Make in India Summit, which was held in Bombay earlier this year, coincidentally over Valentine's Day, shows that our love affair with manufacturing is ready to begin. Thank you very much, sir. Only a woman could have said that. <laughs> David, over to you to open comments. Thank you very much, Ruchi. Well, pictures speak uh, a thousand words, and there's uh, the Tata Group chairman, Cyrus Mystery, writing uh, a piece about uh, Make in India. So, I mean, it's certainly something we're um, fully behind. But Steve's right. It's, you know, in, in a sense, it's not a new concept. There's been Make in India uh, in one way or another for a long time. Tata has had international collaborations involving manufacturing, um, the automotive sector, for example, uh, for a long time. So, so what's new? Well, I guess the Make in India campaign, uh, Prime Minister Modi's campaign, is what's new. And um, I guess um, you know, the thing about campaigns can often be how they look at one end uh, of the world uh, can be rather different from how they need to look at the other end of the world. Um, now, if you're in India, you are quite understandably talking about how you're building up manufacturing capacity, how you're going to find jobs for uh, a large, huge number of people coming onto the workforce uh, every year. Absolutely right. Looking at it here in London for uh, people who are either, I guess, representing uh, British or European companies or working with them uh, one way or another, um, it's got to be about something different. The offer uh, is, is, is something very different. I think there's a very strong uh, offer there. And um, I think, actually, we've heard uh, already, it's the trouble being last speaker, um, we've heard the key points of that already. It's about openness. We've seen, uh, as, as Suhail said, even this week, uh, more uh, announcements of uh, uh, deregulation of uh, FDI. Um, it's about, uh, I love the phrase, being the front office of the world. It's about high-value-added manufacturing. This is no longer about um, kind of bargain basement uh, manufacturing, cheap outsourcing. This is about, uh, for example, in, in, in Tata's case, too, uh, uh, manufacturing uh, precision aircraft components, uh, for example, in India. Um, and I think um, one, one of the things that strikes me working for uh, an Indian business is that we know that uh, high-value-added uh, manufacturing, high-value-added uh, IT services uh, are at the heart uh, of what's going on in India. I'm not sure everybody outside always does, and there's sometimes a default back to a sense, well, this must be in some way, this is all about labour labor cost arbitrage, and of course it isn't. Um, so I think there's a, there's a strong message that needs to come out there. It's not going to be the same message that you're necessarily using to motivate people in India, probably because they know that. Um, so, But I think in... Um, a world where we're, we're moving to greater uh, automation in many areas, greater opportunities for distri distributed manufacturing. So there's a real role for India at the, uh, you know, the, t the top and the middle of, of, of these value chains, certainly not just at the bottom of them. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David, for those comments there. Um, I'd like to actually pick up on perhaps what is a common thread throughout um, all, all your opening comments, um, but um, perhaps um, the best um, well framed through Sohail's second pillar, which was India is ready for business. And actually what I would like to, to, to think about uh, and ask you is around the perspective, uh, the extent to which the, you know, the challenges that we face in manufacturing to actually enable people to feel like India is ready for business in this area. What do you think some of the key challenges that, um, that organizations would face in this area? There are a couple of them. Number one is land acquisition. It's become a very tricky subject. Uh, before David started working for the Tatars, Tatars had to endure a whiplash of an absolutely maniacal chief minister who's been re-elected uh, when she threw them out of Singur. And, and Bengal has continue to suffer to this day because it, it exhibited a reluctance for manufacturing. Land acquisition is a very critical thing. We have an issue in India about separating the tiller from the soil. Not every farmer who tills the, tills the fields is actually the owner of that land. So there are these sociological issues which the government needs to address. Number three, because of cronyism in which almost every industrial house was involved other than the Tatars and two, three others, there was cronyism, and what you did was you acquired land, you acquired licenses through the back door. All of that has stopped. If you look at land registration today, 87% of India's land registration is online. Everything is transparent. Commodities, raw material, all are auctionable under Supreme Court guidelines. So what you're doing, Rishi, is you're sending the message that 
you have nothing to fear if you're doing things honestly, transparently, and in the right manner. Earlier, a BAE Systems or any, any other firm which comes in from the outside would need an Indian partner, not for his prowess in manufacturing, but for his prowess in you know, navigating the corridors of power. Those corridors today stand empty except for the people who are inside their offices working hard. That's changed. I think the significant advantage that India has is the duality of purpose. As a market, it's growing at 7.8 to 7.9%, no matter which metric you look at. So you have a huge consumptive domestic market. You also have a huge export market. Please understand, if you look at the world today, Africa and Asia are the growing continents, as it were. We have a 7,200 kilometer coastline, which we haven't harnessed for effective use in terms of freight. So those advantages are also there. If you look at the, the, the connectivity, up until Modi came, <clears throat> 27,000 villages had zero electricity, 65,000 villages had minor, which means a bulb would light up for about three hours a day. So these are the problems we were faced with. Today in the core sectors, which is power, we've had enormous progress. If you look at coal linkages, it's been cleared. If you look at manufacturing, labor reforms have kicked in. And the last bit is going to be the GST, the goods and services tax. Today, each state could levy an additional tax on manufacturers, which was crazy. Because, you know, what you could buy in state one at, let's say, 10 pounds, you would buy in state two at 14. And they'd be making obscene windfall profits on things even like aviation uh, uh, fuel. All that is going to change, hopefully. So I'm very optimistic, but my optimism is not grounded in jingoism. My optimism is grounded in net results that we are seeing. We're seeing more and more people making inquiries of doing business. Private enterprise of Indian origin is also farming into sectors like defense. You know, Tata's under Ramdurai, Mahindra and Mahindra. So we're seeing these changes. And I think uh, India is more than ready. Finally, India is like the bumblebee. Aerodynamically, the bumblebee is not supposed to fly because of its size. But you see, the bumblebee doesn't know that, so it flies happily. <laughs> Great comment, sir. Steve, David, any other comments around the challenges that, that, are, that are being faced um, in this environment? I, 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 I would rather, I mean, I'm, I'm based in, in London, so uh, some of this is secondhand, but I do hear from my colleagues, and, and so I was very kind to say that um, you know, Tata has a, has a long history of uh, doing business in a very straight way and uh, sees the benefits of a central government system uh, which uh, favours that. Um, and, and I, I I'm sure there will be people in, in the audience who could point to uh, counterexamples somewhere within India. But I think it's really important, uh, and you see this around the world, to have examples of good practice. Because uh, there can often be that sense, well, it has to be like that around here. Don't you understand the local reality? It's always going to be like that. Nothing can change. Well, when you see good practice, it can spread because people can see the benefits of it. Uh, and, and, and it kills the argument dead that you, you can't do that round here. So I think that's very positive. I think the, the, the three elements, uh, we've had skills as well. We have digital. Digital government getting things done more quickly, more efficiently. It's an interesting um, question about digital. Um, if you ask uh, people, I think, in the British uh, civil service, they'll say the great thing about digital uh, government is it brings the, uh, the civil servant closer to the customer, to the citizen. Uh, if you ask in a lot of countries, they'll say, no, the great thing about it is it takes the civil servant away from oh, really? the citizen, so there's no backhander. So one way or another, it can be efficient and it can be clean and straight too. So I think a lot of the ingredients are there. No doubt these things take time, but they're coming together. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Steve, perhaps can I ask you a direct question mm -hmm. relating to some of the reforms that recently took place around FDI in the defense sector specifically. How do you think um, BAE would benefit um, from some of these key reforms that are taking part, which obviously are a direct relationship with the Make in India movement? Yeah, I think there have been an, a number of uh, reforms that we've seen, particularly on the defense side around the um, new defense uh, procurement procedures that were, that were introduced. Um, good things in terms of what they're looking to do to simplify some of the, the offset regulations, uh, raising the threshold for um, when that can cut in. There still needs to be a lot, uh, a lot more to be done. Um, 
One of the key challenges from a defence point of view, which I'm sure, David, you'll get to appreciate, is the long gestation period of some of these programmes. Um, I mean, the Hawk programme itself must have taken over 15 years from its inception to when the contract was signed. And I can point to a number of other um, examples of that. You know, that's got to change because clearly... If you're attempting to, you know, attract private sector investment, you know, they're not going to hang around for, the, for that long. Um, not least, of course, given the competition with the, you know, the, the defence public sector undertaking companies. Um, so that needs, that whole dilemma and pro, pro, problem needs to be resolved. Um, a lot of people, though, are talking about FDI. Um, for me, personally, in my company, it's not something that actually I can get too excited about at the moment. Um, stepping out of my, my company and looking at it, yeah, absolutely, if you're a business looking to go in to invest in, in India, you're going to look at a, a number of issues around risk and return, and one of those is ease of big doing business, transparency is so important these days, but actually how much control do you have? But given that there are other issues around the Indian taxation system, you know, how do you get your profits out once you've made them? Um, and our strategy is very much at the moment not to necessarily uh, invest at the moment, but work with local companies, as I said earlier, to transfer technology and sort of grow in India, sort of indigenously organically. So, yeah, I would welcome anything that's done in FDI. I must say, though, that this move from 100% um, investment in the defence has always been there on a case-by-case -case basis, and I think that that actually is still, is still the intent. You know, you've still got to get permission. So, yeah, good, moving in the right directions, but we must always acknowledge that it's part of a bigger package of reforms. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, just one final question from me before I open up to the panel for some, um, sorry, to the audience for some questions. Um, one of the, uh, a couple of concepts that, that we talked about, um, things around high value manufacturing, um, automation in the sector, um, you know, uh, di um, distributive manufacturing things and concepts uh, as such like. Yet on, this, on the flip side, we've always, you know, India has been known for having low level based manufacturing. And I want to pick up on to understand, do we think we're ready for some of the, the high value manufacturing um, capability that, that it needs to have moving forward to be really competitive in this space? See, to my mind, <clears throat> that again is a myth because, you know, a lot of people don't know that 80 to 90 percent of automotive manufacturing is in the precision high value space. Uh, there are companies like HCL, which is a competitor to Tata's TCS, which is doing stuff with Boeing, for instance. So there is high value manufacturing. It's not getting talked about. What gets talked about is the fact that because it's a largely populated country, you're looking at low value, high volume goods. But that's not the case. Number one. Number two, I've often argued that India will only earn its rightful place in the software domain when we can create an Apple and a Google rather than have Indian origin CEOs running those companies. I mean, other than Apple, of course. <clears throat> but if you see Google and Microsoft, they're run by people of Indian origin. But we've never created a proprietary brand which has so much of inherent value. So there has been a labor arbitrage in the entire software back office or back processing uh, business, which, by the way, will migrate as soon as other countries have basic proficiency in English. So that's, that's a worry. Having said that, high value manufacturing requires a lot of front end investment. And Steve's point about ease of business, transparency, return on investment within a qualified time is what all investors look for. No one invests in countries because they like the climate. They invest in countries because they like the returns. If we can qualify the returns and then determine who should we have in our country to do high-end manufacturing, then it'll make sense. You know, all these seminars, conferences, and all the rara thing about, oh, India's great, Britain is great, blah, blah, I mean, well, Great Britain, uh, it doesn't hold anymore. People are looking for investment, and they're looking for qualified time in terms of return. And I think more than ever before, India is sending out very strong signals that we're ready for business. More importantly, we're ready for manufacturing. Yes, yeah. David, any comments? Um, you know, I, I, I think we do need to nail, nail on the head the idea that it's all low value. I mean, aerospace, automotive, um, you know, automotive manufacturing is, is, is not low value. Um, you know, precision engineering, um, you know, Titan Watches, one of the Tata companies, yeah. um, uh, manufactures for Seiko in Japan. Um, 
we have a, a, an interesting um, and less well-known company called Tata Alexi, which is into um, electronic systems design and manufacturing, car dashboards, for example, electronics engineering, because it's got a link to the moving parts and, and smart design. They manufacture for quite a lot of uh, very premium uh, automotive OEMs who don't want to say who they, who they are, as usual. But um, they're there. This is, this, is not, this is not cheap bargain basement stuff. It's there. It's there now. Can there be more of it? Is there growth capacity? Of course there is. But um, are there constraints? Yes. Can they be dealt with? Yes. But it's there already. And I think that I do think there's a challenge. Um, I mean, everybody, I don't think this, what I'm saying surprises anybody in, 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 in this room, but it probably would surprise some people outside it. And I think there's a, there's a selling job to be done there still. Just one quick point. All of you have to thank Tata Elixir for the Pringles you eat. <laughs> the design and the processes of those Pringle wafers stacking up is a Tata Alexi contribution to the world. See? Thank you. Thinking about food already. It's now 500 pounds. <laughs> I've said Tata four times and Pringles once. I mean, you know, you, you, we agreed you'd pay me about 600, but I'm willing to settle because given Brexit and the pound. So, I, also, I think part of this, there's, there's another issue that we need to consider, which is about skills development. Um, and both whether you're looking to invest in or, you know, India companies, that's got to be so important. And I don't think that it's necessarily being treated in quite the way that it needs to be. Um, very, very quickly, when Modi was here, they set up this CEO's forum. Cyrus leads from the Indian side, like Jerry Grimshaw from the uh, UK side. And one of the things they were looking at are ease of doing business and the, the sector that I'm involved in, defence, manufacturing and, and, and security. One of the things that we are really looking to take forward is how can we get greater collaboration between industry in India and academia? Now, that happens an awful lot here in terms of R&D, and a huge amount of money is, is pumped into it. Um, we need to replicate that in, in India. And, you know, without wishing to get Pandora out of a box, I think one of the first things that we need to uh, resolve as a, between India and UK is actually sorting out a fairly decent visa situation that can allow people from India to come and be skilled in the UK and actually... British people or U people from the UK going into India to benefit from their schools. And I know many, many examples. One of the groups we're working with on this is JCB. I'm sure you yeah. know JCB in India. Absolutely huge. What a fantastic success story. One of the problems they have is actually bringing their workforce into the UK. They're not going to stay. They're not going to take jobs. You know, they're there for training. And we, we don't seem to have a, a system in place that can deal with that at a government level. Thank you very much. Um, can I open up to some questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Perhaps we wait for the microphone. Um, thank you to um, all three speakers for um, some very uh, illuminating and, and interesting comments. Uh, my question is uh, linked to, so we've talked a lot about um, large businesses, global businesses, and also large Indian businesses. Um, I have links um, to London, but I also have links to um, uh, the South Indian city of, of Coimbatore, which has quite an entrepreneurial culture. There are lots of SMEs, um, you know, areas like wet grinders and textiles and various other things. I was wondering whether, you know, what, there were any reflections on what this program means for SME-level manufacturing. Yeah. <clears throat> Under the Make in India, there are three verticals. Vertical one is for high value, low volume, but high value export uh, centric. There's another which is for reasonably lower value, but high volume. And the third is only directed to, towards the SMEs. The fourth vertical, which is not part of Make in India, is the whole Startup India Fund, uh, which the government has set up, which allows entrepreneurs and young people to just get up and you know start their businesses either in the digital or the non-digital space so smes are an important uh, area of concern the problem was <clears throat> under the congress and before that under successive governments banks gave excessive loans to people who have stressed the banks beyond repair and the sme sector was getting choked so that is kind of freeing up now but SMEs do form the backdrop of India's manufacturing base. I mean, if you go to Calcutta and just cross the, uh, the Ganges, which is known as the Hooghly, and you'll see all the foundries that have been set up. I mean, almost all manholes uh, in, in Central Park 
and the ones that remain in Hyde Park that haven't been stolen are made in, uh, in those foundries in, uh, in, in Hookley. So we have an entire construct of businesses in the SME space which are now getting money which they were earlier starved of. I find that actually a really, a really great question. Um, clearly, in, in the startup environment, I find, well, I feel like there's a lot of um, sort of interconnectivity happening at the, S, at the sort of MNC type of level. And yet, actually, I wondered if the panelists have any comment around how SMEs are able to now internationalize um, and some of the barriers that, that you know, Indian SMEs have to actually reaching um, foreign-based markets. Yeah, I mean I think one of the, the issues with you know SMEs is is that they've got to understand where they sit. You know, they're not going to take on the big boys. So what they need to do, I believe, is actually focus on their on their quality, on where they sit within the supply chain. And just a couple of quick quick examples on that. You know, attending some of these other forums, you know, the JetCos where people get together and discuss these. One of the things that has, has been from the UK side or from, from inward investment into India that that is, is a bit of a barrier is say, you know, it's fine if you want to deal at the tier one level absolutely no problems with that you know the Tatars the Mahindras spot on but as you get down to the tier two and the tier three it becomes increasingly more difficult more complex because you know the quality sometimes that you need is is actually just just not there so one of the programs that we're looking at is it's just been announced an m triple seven one five five gun it's just been approved by the defense acquisition council so it'll now move forward part of that program though you know it's a gun out of out, out of the us will be a significant amount of investment that we're going to put into the indian supply chain both associated with the um, production of that gun and actually mahindras are going to do the final assembly integration and testing but actually also to integrate some of the indian supply chain back into our supply chain and try and lift their standards like that. So absolutely important, but I think there's got to be a real focus, and this has got to be through the Indian government as well, is actually getting the whole quality of that Indian supply chain advanced so it can compete more effectively. Thank you. Can I take another question, please? Yes, sir. Hi. Perhaps just give me a second, let's wait for the microphone. Hi, my name is uh, David Walker. Um, I've been working in India for the last 10 years or so in the, in the house building uh, area. Um, one of the things that's uh, surprised me over the time of being in India is how much of the um, economy is still controlled by government. Uh, and I mean in terms of the ownership of banks, the ownership of mineral rights, power, electricity generation. So very socialist, I think, in that way. And I think certainly from our point of view, we found that that's been a huge constraint in terms of private enterprise being able to deliver is because you don't get the support on, on that area. And I think, um, you know, with Modi's election, many of us did think that it would be a Margaret Thatcher in, in, in event for India and there would be a huge privatization and the benefits of, of efficiency into those areas. <coughs> so I think um, that for me, I think has been a disappointment that there's less acceptance of of the free market, if you like, and move towards the more efficient production out of the private sector rather than continuing to be government controlled. Maybe Mr. Seth can apply his marketing brains to a slogan to promote <coughs> free markets and, 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 and privatization within the Indian uh, environment. Thankfully, we don't have stakes in RBS and Barclays in the Indian government. But let me <coughs> address the question. Remember, India is and has to be cognizant of pricing issues in critical areas such as power and water. You know, politicians don't work for the economy alone. They work to get re-elected. So it's going to be very difficult for a politician to say, OK, I'm going to privatize everything, especially in the utilities area. Having said that, Bombay <clears throat> as an island, for, for the longest time, the distribution, the transmission distribution was start par. If you look at Delhi, it's privatized, the distribution. You look at Calcutta. It's again privatized. Steps are being taken. What had happened was, and there you're absolutely right, the states which make up the Union of India had state electricity boards. In order to pander for votes, what was happening was you were giving away free water and free electricity to farmers. It was free, but it wasn't available. So now what they're doing is they're injecting price <clears throat> so that it's not free, but available. The farmer in India wants to pay for power and water. The myth that was being circulated was that if we give it free, we will have uh, you know, greater traction during the elections. But look at some of the other critical areas of concern. And here Modi has made rapid progress. It's obviously not being reported as much. We didn't have soil testing. 
in our agriculture base, we had a situation where it was cash crops. So farmers were quickly changing crops depending on which government would offer minimum support pricing. Effectively put, a government would pick up sugarcane. In order again to pander to the farmer, they'd raise the price, thereby knock off all the sugar companies. They'd be out of business. All of that is changing. But remember, you don't move to a free market when 67% of your people cannot afford two meals a day. You don't work towards a free market, a completely free market, when you're actually looking at a situation of almost 18 to 19% of your overall population being below the poverty line. These changes require time. I completely agree with you. The government has no business in being in business, but the government also has a social responsibility, especially in India. You have a situation in Orissa, which is mineral rich, but completely impoverished. Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, I mean, you know, these are just names for you guys, but these are states which are mineral rich, but their people live in abject poverty. Because what we've seen is, We've seen development at the cost of the people. Today, development must embrace the people. And in order for development to embrace the people, you have to take baby steps. You can't take a giant step overnight. It's not like Neil Armstrong on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just one thought, uh, and more, more about, in a way, how the, um, the, the rest of the world sees what's going on in India. Uh, and I'm not an expert on Indian politics, but you know, most of what we remember Margaret Thatcher for now was not done in her first term. <laughs> uh, I think these things do take time. They also take parliamentary majorities of a kind that she had uh, and that Prime Minister Modi has not had since the beginning of his term, if you look at the upper house. So I think one does have to... Uh, it, it's, it's, it's great to be uh, enthusiastic, it's great to be ambitious, it's great to be demanding of politicians, but if they don't always achieve everything we want first time round, it doesn't mean they've necessarily failed and the whole thing's going the wrong way. Any other questions from the audience? So. Um, I'm Raymond Whitaker from Asian Affairs magazine. Um, I think you know, overhanging this discussion is um, how is this going to be affected by Brexit? Um, perhaps not made in India, but uh, the two companies you gentlemen represent. Um, especially Tata Europe, uh, I imagine they're headquartered in London because of British membership of the EU. Um, how is that going to change? Uh, I suppose that's for me. Um, well, uh, I'm in London because uh, Tata Limited, which is a company I head, has been in London since 1907. Uh, we have uh, a substantial amount of, 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 of business uh, in the UK. Uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues and, uh, and bosses, as it were, in India talk about the UK as Tata's second home market. Um, we, we've said that we remain uh, firmly committed uh, to, uh, to the UK. Um, what we've uh, also said in our statement uh, the other day was that um, obviously all our businesses always review uh, their strategy and operations uh, on a continuous basis to, to see what's going on and see what they need to do. We'll obviously continue to do that. What we've also said is that access to markets and to skilled labour will remain very important to us. Um, all that applies. But I think um, Tata has always taken a long-term view uh, and we will continue to take a, a long-term view. Yeah, I mean, just quickly and lastly, I mean, from our, our point of view, we're a, we're a UK defence company. We're, we're headquartered in, in the UK. We've got operations in the US, etc., etc. The way we operate in, in India, we are a registered company. We have a board. We have a, 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 an Indian chairman. Uh, will that change? No. Um, the bit I worry about, though, is that in my business, a lot of these deals are very heavily influenced at that government-to-government -government relationship. A number of uh, countries do use defence procurement as an extension of foreign policy, if that's the right phrase. Um, I worry, to be quite honest with you, with a UK out of Europe, someone like Modi or whoever will be there in the future will look and say, actually, do I want to have a relationship now at, a, at an important level with the UK or actually with a France or with a Germany? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I, it is a concern. Thank you, Steve. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'd just like to get some closing comments from the, from the panellists. So, David, perhaps may I start with you for your closing thoughts? I think when um, governments talk about um, trade and investment, it's all about how much can we sell 
abroad and how much can they invest in uh, our country. Uh, when business looks at it, uh, it doesn't look at it like that. It looks at it in terms of supply chains. It looks at it in terms of opportunities. It looks in terms of costs and capabilities. And I think if you look at it in terms of all of those things, there are some uh, immense uh, opportunities uh, in India for uh, international business and making India is a good way of describing it. I think <clears throat> in investor affinity increases with a visible, demonstrable track record. I think over the last two, two, two and a half years, <clears throat> that track record is pretty visible in terms of ease of doing business, transparency. I don't think there's any moving back from that because of the attendant global pressures as also governance issues. So I think more than ever before, India today is not only sloganeering about make in India, but it's actually setting in motion the wheels of progress that will allow for mobility of investment from across the world, including from within India, into the manufacturing space. I think that augurs well for us as a nation and for the world. I mean, you know, look at the attendant issues you have with China being the only reasonably sized manufacturing hub. I mean, they have you, you know, by your neck all the time. And uh, I mean, I was going to use the word neck. <laughs> just that a cough interrupted me. But if that changes, and as Steve says, there is a geopolitical, there is a foreign policy attendant issue with all of that. The reason why Obama can't bargain really tough with China is because of the, uh, you know, hinged relationship between the two countries. So I think we'll be an effective spoiler, and we've got to get our house in order. I think Narendra Modi is doing a splendid job of it. And I didn't vote for him, so I don't owe these guys anything. <laughs> No, actually, I, I, I think just reiterate what's been said, you know, making India is very important, but I think what we don't want to do ever is, is, is become complacent and, and stop trying to move forward, you know, thinking enough is enough, no, I mean, as people that have business in, in India or engaged in India, you know, you must never stop demanding more. As I said, making India will only work if it's part of a wider set of trans, you know, reforms. And one of them which we all are concerned about in business these days is that of transparency, you know, risk return, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, yeah, it's going in the right direction, but it still has got an awful long way to go. Thank you. Finally, I just want to thank the panelists for, for your time and, and what has been a, a really stimulating debate. So thank you, all three of you. How do you know this is a Make in India panel? It starts 20 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> At least we are consistent. <laughs>